Hello, puppies and kittens. I'm talking with Jackson Rowe, who wanted to uh, go over a few things about, you know, the Noachian flood and some of the other reasons that the flood is impossible. I mean, one of the one of the things we we didn't get through uh, the particulars of different species, and uh, some of that is is going to be covering today. Is that right, sir? That's right. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm kind of humoring the creationists. I'm going to talk a lot about the kinds that they would have the family level. I'm going to humor them a little bit just okay. so they can't argue against this. Okay. But, well, let, I, I don't know if they can't argue against it. Cause I've, when magic becomes your default excuse, yeah. I don't, I don't know what to say. Well, when they resort to magic, they lose the argument. Well, I've heard that, that they could yeah. just have that God could have just, you know, performed a flurry of miracles a minute. Yeah. You know, to, to make up for all of this. And, and one, one person told me that, yeah, he knew that there was that there's these capacity problems, but in order to refuse to admit any kind of evolution at all, he decided that that Noah had cryogenic embryos of every animal species on Earth refrigerated on his boat. That's quite uh, some technology for the Bronze Age. Yeah, I'm also thinking about and what do you do with these mammalian embryos when you get where you're going? You got to implant them in something. Yeah, and we know, and I don't mean the ground, but you know, yeah. hey, it's it's God, so it's magic, so you can just. Well, no, you can't spill your seed on the ground, can you? Because God, oh yeah, that's not allowed. That. Not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, go ahead. Let, let, let's right. hear what you have. Go ahead and, uh, share the screen. All right, so lima beans submerged, watered yeah. with salt water. Yeah, this is just a simple experiment anybody can do. It's a lot more sophisticated. It starts out simple. All right, I, I watered these with brackish water, one with fresh water. Uh, guess what happened to the ones that watered with brackish water? They did not grow. And these were just watered. They weren't submerged for a year. So that's uh, one aspect of it. All right, now we get a little more uh, technical as we go on. Uh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was, I'm listening. Okay. Uh, the tuatara is a, a lizard-like reptile. It's not exactly a lizard. It's in its own order. Uh, native to New Zealand. If we're to believe the flood story, a pair walked thousands of my miles from Mount Ararat <clears throat> over the supposed land bridge of Indonesia to Australia, then across the sea to New Zealand, because there would have been no land bridge from there. Problem is this, they have a low metabolism, so they're going to move over this distance very slowly. And they don't do well in warm temperatures. So crossing the equator is not a good idea. <laughs> uh, yeah. The population of two Ateras before humans arrived is estimated to have been in the millions, based on the range they have now in the population. And they have a very slow reproductive rate. Uh, so just this alone, they, they couldn't have come from Turkey in, in 4,000 years. They couldn't have reached their destination and produced the population they have now. And I have to wonder what the creationists think when there was there were 50, uh, 50 Sphenodonts or thereabouts, as I remember, in the fossil mm -hmm. record. And what we have now, oh, yeah. I think, is two, two species. I think New two Zealand? species of Tuatara. Yeah. Yeah. Two yeah. species and of Tuatara. It. But there were other Sphenodonts in the fossil record, up to 50 of them, that's as right. I said, all vaguely yeah. similar. Um, mm -hmm. But would Noah have had 50? Sphenodonts. Uh, and I think if you, I think if you're going to be realistic, and none of this is realistic, you would have to bring all of them. But maybe they would argue you only had one Sphenodont kind. I don't know. Oh, no. Answers of Genesis says you can have 1,400 original kinds and produce mm -hmm. everything from that. Yeah. And I say, hey, we, why not do one better? Because you can have just w one pair of birds, and they will eventually produce. All the birds of the variety. Oh, but you've only got 4,500 years, don't you? You know, it's funny. I, I talked to Ken Hoven once. Uh, he I'm once sorry. said that emus and ostriches may not be related, which I thought was very funny. But anyway. May not be, may related? Not be related? Yeah, he said, well, we need to do some research into that. It's like, oh, we do we? <laughs> oh, like like everybody hadn't already done that. Yeah, like the ratite kind yeah so to speak <laughs> they're all the ratites they're of course they're related 
Yeah, emus, yeah. ostriches, rays, mm-hmm. cassowaries, elephant, bird, moa, moa. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and uh, a kiwi. Yeah, kiwis. Did you say elephant birds. Yep. Yeah, elephant birds. Yeah. Of those, are, those are my favorite. I wish they were. Not, I wish they were not extinct. All right, Fiji bandit and crest of the iguanas. Supposedly they're descent. Well, they are descended from the the iguanas of South America. Supposedly the iguana kind. Only two iguanas had to be on the ark, according to answers in Genesis. That creates a new problem. This means in Noah's flood story, the iguanas had to cross both the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean and wind up by chance in Fiji in the span of 4,000 years and separate into the two species you see here. Uh, what are the odds of that, do you think? Well, I'm also wondering, since you, the, the answers in Genesis is saying that there's only two iguanas, and that means yeah. that the marine mm-hmm. iguanas and the terrestrial iguanas mm-hmm. of uh, the Galapagos Islands, well, yeah. then they would have had to have been derived from them. And we know how they got there. It was it was it was, a, it was the marine iguanas that got there first, and then when uh, some of them got into land, they divided up, and and uh, and and some of them just became perpetually terrestrial. Then in Costa Rica, we have the basilisk, mm-hmm. which is another you know iguana that has the the, the three sails and is famous as, as the Jesus lizard for being able to run yeah. on the water. And I'm I'm just a little curious how they and and then in Mexico we've got the spiny tailed iguana. Well, of course in Mexico we've got all the iguanas, don't we? Pretty much, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's strange how they proliferate like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so why? Okay, okay go ahead. Um, so, no, you're good. Uh, we uh, I, we can beat them over the head with this island endemism all day long. It's just it goes on, on and on. We'll uh, we'll get more into that in a minute. The the Antarctic tooth fish is a good example of an animal that shouldn't exist today. They have glycoproteins in their blood. They're adapted to cold water and cold water only. You put them in warm water, they're not going to make it long. And the creationists admit the oceans would be warm. And of course, we know that with the accelerated nuclear decay required for the Earth to appear as old as it is, it would be pretty warm. So a few magnitudes over, you know, I mean, it's just ridiculous. But these same people argue and in this that warm you ocean, have like a pair of cats. I'm oh, sorry. They argue that you could have a pair of cats on the ark, and then mm-hmm. the, the, in the these early early depictions, very ancient depictions, you've got lions and house cats in Egyptian artifacts. Yeah, at the time that the flood was supposed to have happened. So already, mm-hmm. and, then, and then prior to that, we've got cave paintings of leopards. That's right, and lions again. So we know that lions and leopards and house cats predated the flood yet yet creationists would say that they're all the same kind and that you only needed to have one pair of cats on board we have proof that that there's more than that well that somehow all of that was after the flood because dating methods don't work no dating method works according to them artifacts in egypt yeah i don't know how they rationalize it documented history what the (laughs) yeah i don't know all right go ahead they've got to twist it all right Krill populations, due to the temperature changes and the warm water, especially the Antarctic krill, would crash uh, in the ocean, be on steep decline, if not go extinct completely. Blue whales eat four tons of krill a day. So why do blue whales continue to exist? There are about 20, 10 to 20,000 of them today, but they're pre-1800s. Eight, there were like a couple hundred thousand in the ocean. And yeah, yeah. Here's an interesting example. The new Caledonian coral pine, Parasitaxis, a parasitic conifer that attaches to only one other species of conifer. Now, they're not even photosynthetic. They're paras- parasites completely. The adult trees would die in a flood. Uh, conifers especially do very poorly when submerged, even in fresh water, let alone water with any salinity. Even if the seeds somehow survived, what are the odds of them landing, both landing in New Caledonia and growing again together? Well, it, it, they didn't, though. They, we know that they landed in Turkey, and right. then somehow these trees walked there. Right. <laughs> Noah would have had to bring all the plants. I mean, they would have died in the ocean. There's no way. And that, that gives me to my next uh, example, the Rafflesia. If you leave the Rafflesias in the ocean, they're, they're going to die. They have a complex parasitic life cycle. They're a parasite 
of specific tetrastigma vines, which are themselves parasites of certain trees. They're the flowers are pollinated by flies and dispersed by tree shrews and javan porcupines. So here's a list of things that need to happen for the Rafflesias to still exist. First of all, the seeds have to survive at sea for a year, which is not likely. The tetrastigma seeds have to survive for a year, the vines. The host, seed, host tree seeds must survive for a year. <clears throat> the pollinating flies, which have short lifespans that wouldn't be able to breed at sea, must survive for a year. The trees have to grow back, and the seeds of the, the Rafflesia have to survive even longer in unsuitable conditions. The tetrasigma seeds and Rafflesia seeds must land in the same location for the Rafflesia to take hold, and then only the correct species for the, of the 57 tetrasigma vine. The pollinators have to be in the area. The two species of mammal that eat the fruit must repopulate Southeast Asia from Turkey and spread the seeds. This must happen to all 30 or so Rafflesia species or they go extinct. Okay, now, what, so yeah. let, me, let me play devil's advocate for a moment. Uh, and uh, just um, give you the, the creationist argument uh, all for right. all of your different points as I see it. Okay. Why do you hate God? <laughs> that's... <laughs> That's a, yeah, that's about the only response I can think of to all that, really. All right. Everyone knows this, but mo most butterflies and moths have an incredibly short life cycle. As adults, luna moths, silkworm moths, one week. The birdwing butterfly pictured here, which there are many species, live for about three months as adults. And their entire life cycle doesn't span more than usually 100 days for most butterflies. Of course, they lay eggs on specific plants, which all would be underwater during the flood. Adults, li adults don't live long enough to uh, lay more eggs on the plants that are submerged. So why are butterflies alive today? They would have had to have been on the ark, but then you have to grow whole forests of different plants for the well, different species. Well, let's be specific. God said that he would bring every animal that had the breath of life. Somehow arthropods don't, according to creationists. According you know, to Christians, they don't have yeah. lungs, and so God just preserves them. Part of His flurry of miracles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they they really have no explanation for this. Of what happened to the insects, arthropods? Similar situation with the Hercules beetle. The adults live for six to eight months. The larvae and pupa live in uh, rotting logs, which of course would not do well in the flood. They'd sink to the bottom. The larva would drown. And the adult beetles would unable, be unable to breed. So the fact these exist is re refutation of the flood. Same for the titan beetle. Then the, the adults live maybe a few weeks because they, they don't eat. They don't have mouth parts. That's Mountain building termites. Know. The pull, adult, the, the, these adult beetles, they all of mm -hmm. them, they starve. Oh, no, just the titan beetle. Well, that's what the, all of the, the titan, titan beetles. Beetle. You said they don't have mouth parts, so all these titan beetles here, the adults don't don't feed. Yeah. Um, I'm just I'm just pondering that you, you throw out the flood for a moment. Let's just talk about intelligent design. Yeah. A lot of butterflies and moths are the same. They they don't feed as adults. Mystifying. So, it it is. It's not a very good design when you think about it. Evolution is uh, only concerned with how well you reproduce. That's right. So that once, once you've gotten past the reproductive age, there, there's not an impetus mm -hmm. for how you can improve that. The only way to improve our longevity, I read, was that if, we, if everybody waited until they were like 25 to have their first kid or 30, yeah. mm -hmm. if everyone waited and had their first kid at 30 years old, instead of 20 or 15 then uh we could in 80 generations substantially prolong our lifespans i've never heard that i read what many years ago yeah anyway uh mound building termites uh, they cultivate fungus kind of like the leaf cutter ants in their nests for food uh, these structures would be totally destroyed in the flood of course and the termites would either drown or starve so termites like these mountain building termites shouldn't exist. Aphids, there are 5,000 species of aphids. 99% feed only on one family of plants. After the flood, assuming aphids somehow survived, they have to find their host plant again thousands of times over. What are the odds of that? 
So, so Noah would have had two of every one of these subspecies because the different plants, <laughs> or or one of the aphid kind, and they diversified into five thousand. I'm not sure. Yeah, who knows? They don't even know. Uh, fireflies, same same situation. Two months, adults uh, larvae live underground. They would have drowned. Should die. Cicada life cycle, the adults, they don't feed either as adults. They live for a matter of weeks. They're the only are adults to breed. They live years underground, feeding on tree sap from roots as larva. And the larva, of course, would drown in the flood, and the adults don't live long enough to wait the flood out. So why do they still exist? Yeah. And you know, and you know, once off the ark, the animals are pretty much screwed because every ecosystem is destroyed. The pandas have to wait two years for the bamboo forests to grow back in. The mangroves have to have two years also. Koalas are pretty screwed. They have to wait for 10 years for the eucalyptus forest to grow back. Old growth forest, uh, animals that rely on old growth forest, there are a lot of those. Got to wait 50 to 100 years. The, the pygmy goby, this is the shortest lived vertebrate in the world that's known has a lifespan of a total of two months, and that's including its larval phase. Now, the species breeds in coral reefs, which, of course, would be destroyed during the flood. So why is this animal not extinct? You tell me this is alive and the trilobites aren't? <laughs> Seems like an unequal trade. All right, freshwater mussels. They're sensitive to water quality, salinity, and depth. I didn't include that in here. And turbidity. There are a thousand species globally, about 300 in uh, America, the U.S. Uh, they breed in a parasitic cycle with specific sp fish species. See, I actually found this. I actually took this photo here. This is a sandbank pocketbook mussel with lures. They actually move these lures to attract bluegill only and attach larvae to the gills. Uh, I was pretty excited to come upon that. You don't see this often in nature. You, know, you see it on National Geographic, but not with your own eyes. And of course, salinity would have killed them. Even if they would have survived, they would have been separated from their host fish species. So the sandbank pocketbook, the one I just showed, this isn't the same one I pick, I'm picking up here. That's my photo also. Uh, the, the host fish is the bluegill and just the bluegill which would be separated from the mussels during the flood. Assuming turbidity and salinity didn't kill either of them, what are the odds they land in the same river system after the flood? The sandbank pocketbook mussel should be extinct. But it, here it is in my hand. I hadn't even thought about the, the issue of freshwater fish. I mean, why is it mm -hmm. that chicklets only landed in the... Uh, like in Malawi African or Lake river? Victoria, yeah. Yeah, well, why is it, you know, like... like uh, Polypterus are only in African waters, mm -hmm. and then we have these others that are only in in America. Then we have these others that are famously only in in Eastern Asia. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Animal distributions make no sense in light of a global flood. Uh, animal kinds, uh, quotation marks, that can't be kept in captivity. I I include I three main ones here that are hard to keep in captivity: pangolins, endries, the family of lemurs. I just said the endry. Uh, tarsiers. So pangolins okay. are so right. incredibly right. easy in captivity. And uh, they, they eat live invertebrates. And if they don't, gastrointestinal issues kill them in captivity. So what you're saying is that Noah has to bring more than two ants. Right. They have to, yeah, I get to that in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, he has to bring a lot of ants. Indries eat young shoots of specific leaves, which has never been replicated successfully in captivity with many attempts. They usually live for a couple months in captivity, then they die. Tarsiers do even worse in captivity, uh, mostly because of stress and their diet. Uh, they just stress within weeks or months and, and pass away. They just, they just don't mm. live in captivity. So a, a Bronze Age, Iron Age dude on a boat, it's not going to be able to, to take care of them. Here's the part we're talking about. Ant and termite eating kinds. I'll include the kinds. Echidnas, pangolins, numbats, aardvarks, giant anteater, and silky anteater. I calculated Noah would need to bring uh, 368 million ants and termites for the year-long journey for these animals. So, uh, good luck. 
you know. Which makes me think, you know, couldn't couldn't God have just like put them all in suspended animation? But then if we start yeah. if we start talking about that way, why did God have to flood the entire world just to kill off a handful of Middle Eastern people right. that were making yeah. too much noise? He could what have snapped his fingers and done it? it was, he, yeah, he could have done that. He could have, you know, folded his arm and blinked like genie. He could he could have done yeah. anything he needed to, or he could show up and say, "Be quiet." That would have worked. Mm -hmm. really? Say, "Hey, change your ways, guys." Yeah, Instead any of, number of things, and and but yeah. but of course, no. That's the, yeah. of course we know that the reason that we have the flood legend is not that Noah actually did, you know, that that, mm -hmm. that God actually flooded the world because he didn't. We know that this right. didn't happen. This is just that there was a flood, and people couldn't figure out why there was a flood. And I don't mean the flood. I mean that people right. there's lots of little floods. Right. And every culture that experiences a flood, there's only one way to exaggerate that. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to make if you want to make a flood of, of grander proportions, then of course the only way to go is to eventually flood the whole world. And, and I'm so sure that's why you have so many flood legends where the whole world is right. flooded. And I'm sure a tribe in the Amazon that experiences a flood thinks the entire world flooded because what how much land do they they occupy? How much land do they know about, you know? Yep. Uh coral specific light depth requirements turbidity would kill them so all tropical coral species they should go extinct and that's a huge amount of biodiversity that would be uh, lost there salamander similar situation salinity and uh, they need cool temperatures so you would have to bring them on the ark but then you can't keep these on the ark they, they just wouldn't survive well maybe no uh, diversification of the tortoise oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> maybe noah had plastic waterproof tubs and yeah, well maybe never mind. <laughs> i'm maybe, thinking of all the things the water that all systems. the equipment that herpetologists have for maintaining mm -hmm. axolotls and such because it's yeah. those are tricky even you, axolotls you are difficult yeah you can't even put a substrate in there because the idiots will eat it they eat it yeah i've yeah. i've dealt with that in real life yeah the, I've, i guess whenever i kept salamanders i didn't put any gravel in there at all because they're dumb and they eat it so <laughs> yeah. okay uh the diversification of the tortoise kind according to them there was only one pair of tortoises on the ark which i find especially ridiculous because there are like 80 species of tortoises and they all mature slowly breed slowly move slowly uh geographically which if you're going to try to get to get uh, tortoises to proliferate into the 80 species you're talking about. And you want to, you want this to happen with, from one original pair of tortoises mm -hmm. 4,500 years ago. Yeah. And it's just, it's just ridiculous. So those things live a long time. They do. And they re reproduce very slowly. Very slowly. This is an example. The, uh, the Madagascan spider tortoise, three subspecies plus one other species which I didn't include, the flat-tailed tortoise. Their eggs take about a year to hatch. They lay only a few a year, and they reach sexual maturity at 10 years. Their population once numbered in the millions. There's simply not enough time to diversify once they reach Madagascar, which who knows how long that would even take. How long would it take to go from two tortoises to millions of tortoises? A, a long time. If we're only yeah. talking about one species mm -hmm. and not the 80 species that you were talking about. All right. And yeah, it's, it's pretty ridiculous. Manatees, seagrass would be too deep to undergo photosynthesis, plus manatees and dugongs, they don't dive deep anyway. They're not built to dive more than 100 and 200 feet. They can't, they can't do it. So they would have starved. Yeah. Nesting beaches for, for sea turtles. Uh, sea turtles imprint on the beach they're born on. And according to creationists, the continents moved at this time. So once the water recedes, you have a totally new geography. Uh, so the sea turtles have to find all new nesting beaches. So there should have been a big population crash of sea turtles, if not an extinction event for sea turtles. Unless they, yeah. I don't know, did they bring sea turtles on the ark? <laughs> I'm, I'm not even sure. Yeah, one of the reasons that sea turtles are, uh, survived the uh, Cretaceous Paleogene impact uh, is is reputed to be because of these large populations of hatchling turtles that haven't hatched yet. Yeah, you know all of this calamity is going on, and they're still underground. Much with right. the same thing with crocodilians. 
mm-hmm. have the same excuse. So this, you know, this is the way. Oh, that that and the fact that they have such a low dietary requirement that they can, you know, like like eat one thing a month mm-hmm. and get by with that. Go ahead. Oh yeah. Uh, leaf cutter ants and the Leucogaricus fungus. Uh, leaf cutter ants cultivate this fungus with leaves in their nest. During the flood, obviously the fungus would have been killed by the salinity, or plants would have not been harvested, or the ants themselves would have would not have survived. And the fungus itself is completely dependent on the ants for reproduction. So we got a multi-pronged, intertwined system here. If one fails, they all they all die. You know. And here's an interesting example: uh, the Darwin's orchid and the Morgan Sphinx moth. Uh, they're a symbiotic moth and flower. After the flood, both species have to find each other again because this only this moth fertilizes this flower because of the, the long, the long uh, flower you see here. The odds of this, yeah, this are, of course, are astronomical. And Darwin yeah. discovered the the plant and inferred that the moth must exist. And sure enough, the moth was discovered. Yeah. Uh, he, he, he said the on flower was escape. was migration. impossibly deep for all these other species of moths. There had to be a moth yeah. with this ludicrously long tongue, far longer than any other moth ever. And then, of course, found it later. I remember. Right. That's the predictive power of evolution, but, you know. Yeah. Migration on a new landscape. Creationists claim the continents changed during the flood, of course. This poses the question, how did migration routes for birds, sharks, and whales, butterflies, everything else, become established again? And honeybees, this is an interesting example. Honeybees have a lifespan of 60 days. Their nests would have been destroyed in the flood. And of course, there are no flowers during the flood. So how do they rebuild their honey? How do they feed? How do they breed? Why do bees still exist? No, they don't have the breath of life, so they weren't going to be on the boat because... Yeah. Oh, reasons. Um... Reasons, exactly. (laughs) Here's another one. This is actually a picture I took. This was one of my salamanders back in the day. Bolitoglossa, mm-hmm. a genus of salamander with 130 species. All it will mature at about 10 years of age. How do these diversify from two individuals? This isn't even a kind. This is a genus. So it's the plethodontid family. So it gets even more impossible if you look at it that way. And these are notoriously difficult to keep in captivity. Somehow I was able to keep them, but everyone else that I knew that got them, they died within days. Mm-hmm. Mine lived for two years. And I, before I sold them to somebody else. So I, I don't know if they're alive still or not, but I hope they are. All right. If all dinosaur kinds were on the ark, how did they go extinct? When did they go extinct and why? Creationists have no working hypothesis for their extinction that I've heard. So, I mean, and it makes no sense. Yeah, that was another that argument the, that, that God is supposed to send all of these animals to Noah so that they can mm-hmm. be saved. Yet, you know, we know that there are more genera in the fossil record than are still alive today. And okay. so that would mean that there's more animals on, on way more animals on Noah's Ark. Not, not just the fact that they're all freaking huge or so many of them. Right. Are, but that there are so many more of them than what we have today. Hmm. But. And imagine how many we don't even know about. But 99% of all life, God had, God put it on himself. It's not even down on, down on Noah. God says, I will send them, you know, God, I will bring you all these animals. So all the animals, it's not, it's on God now that all the animals show up to board the the ark. And so we have 99% of all terrestrial fauna is extinct. Right. As soon as the boat lands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not a very efficient, uh, salvation system yeah yeah i mean noah might as well built a spaceship i think it would have been a more realistic story actually (laughs) all right there are at least 94 species of modern cetaceans alive today why did all these survive the floods but not one bacillosaurid whale you may have heard about uh, perucetus that was uh, just unveiled yes uh a few days ago perucetus picture at the top here the, the big one potentially heavier than the blue whale there are 17 pictured here species, not one alive today, but, you know, you know, creationists have no explanation for why that is. They, they should be alive. They're ocean dwelling, they're whales. Why aren't they? 
and they have the breath of life, which That's is right. a problem. But it wasn't right. a problem for the people who wrote the Bible, because if right. you look at uh, medieval yeah. artwork, those people they drew they drew whales as having scales. They drew yeah. whales as if they were fish, yeah. with ray fins and everything. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know that that was breath. They thought that that was water shooting out. Yeah. And on another note, Jonah was probably in one of these whales uh, for th uh, at least three days of the trip. <laughs> There's another funny story of the Bible. But but another thing to miss it. So that the whales survived. But mm. none of the Mosasaurs did, none of the Ichthyosaurs right. did, none of the Plesiosaurs, Chronosaurs, uh, none of that. Yeah, it's, it's a very strange, strange event. It, it's almost like these things lived at different times and they, different <laughs> extinction events wiped them out successively. But that couldn't possibly be an explanation. But anyway, uh, triops and trilobites. Triops are native to like desert environments. They spawn in puddles when it rains periodically their eggs can stay dormant in dry conditions for long periods but these eggs would have been destroyed in the flood and with an adult lifespan of about 90 days why do triops still exist and why would triops survive but the 20,000 plus species of trilobites didn't yeah good point yeah and no ammonites either no ammonites either that's right no eurypterids no anything uh, Methuselah and Prometheus, bristlecone pines that are older than the supposed date of Noah's flood, 4,359 years ago. Methuselah is about 300 years older. Prometheus was 4,844 years old when they cut it down. I forget why they cut it down, but what a, what a disgrace that they did that. Yeah. Yeah. Is that how they, that when they, they realized how old it was, they, they didn't count the tree rings until they yeah. sawed through it? I think they didn't know how old it was until they were like, oh, whoops. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And here's the Mahoade kind, uh, unique Hawaiian honey creepers. They're actually not closely related to a lot of birds. They're, they're really distinct. Uh, seven species in this family had to be descended from two individuals. The pair had to travel in, over unsuitable habitat in the Pacific Ocean to get to Hawaii. The two individuals then had to reproduce on one island and spread to Kauai, Oahu, Molokai, Lanai, Maui, and Hawaii to diversify and into the other species. And creationists asked me to prove to them that speciation happened. Right. They're the ones who say it happens pretty, pretty fast. Yeah. Well, you have examples like this. You know, mm -hmm. where if, even if we assume that there was an ark, even if we assume that there was these two original birds, mm -hmm. you still have to explain everything, you know, the, the subspecies, everything that you just described. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, these are all extinct today. It's a, I've actually looked for one in Kauai, the Kauai O. Oh, it uh, was a really pretty bird, but I uh, didn't see any. I think they're probably extinct for sure. So that's a shame. Uh, penguins in the south. If the starting point was Turkey, why are all penguin species, with the slight exception of the Galapagos penguin, which can go a little bit north of the equator occasionally, why are they all in the southern hemisphere? Norway, Russia, and Greenland are much closer. It would have been a far easier trip. But even if they had wound up in Antarctica, they should have ended up in, Antar in the Arctic too. Why didn't they venture off into, I mean, they would have reproduced and ventured off into different directions. I don't, I don't understand. Uh, Ozark cave fish, they require low turbidity, pristine water quality, and temperatures below 60 degrees. Uh, that goes for most cave fish of the world, so there shouldn't be cave fish today. Uh, it's kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. The devil's hole puff fish, they need a constant 91 degrees with low turbidity and low oxygen. Deviating from this in captivity proves fatal, so how did they survive the Noah's flood? And we were talking about axolotls earlier. Uh, here's the Anderson salamander, uh, the axolotl at the lower left, and the Lake Patsquaro salamander at the lower right. These all require, uh, you know, low temperatures, low salinity, and pretty still water, or they stress out and die. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're only found in one lake each, which is very strange given that, and, oh, it's in Mexico, by the way. How'd they get there? Yeah. Another interesting example, the kiwi and the moa. 
Each bird is slash was native to New Zealand. Each qualifies as a kind as they're each in their own taxonomic orders. As they're flightless, it would be difficult to travel from Turkey to New Zealand and diversify into several kiwi species and about a dozen moa species in that 4,000 year period. Same for the kagu, flightless bird in its own family, native to the island of New Caledonia, would have had to travel over land, bridges, and oceans to get back to its habitat from Turkey. Same for the selenodon. I'll, I'll speed up since we're mm-hmm. since just to save time. Uh, lemur kinds. This is a good example. Five extant lemur kinds and a couple of extinct ones must independently make it back to Madagascar. What are the odds of that? That's pretty astronomical that they all went to Madagascar, all the different kinds of lemur. And what's interesting about that is there, there are there are lemurs, you know, other lemurs, uh, lemuroids in the fossil record. I mean, there's uh, Ida, for example, famous transitional lemur, and she's in the Messel pit in Germany. So right. there were lemurs once upon a time, and somehow they make it just how why did they need a boat if they could get from Africa to Madagascar? And why did they go extinct everywhere but that island? That's a good question. And it's one where they, where they proliferate on that yeah. island into, into multiple species. So again, how many times does speciation happen or that we can confirm that speciation happens in these given locations, especially when you get into islands. Right. And we can just beat them over the head with these island examples all day long on Galapagos, penguins, Hawaiian bats, all this traveling they have to do because this isn't the kind. They have to diversify from the North American variety. So two trips needed. Falkland Island wolf, same story. Rodriguez fruit bat, same story. New Zealand short-tailed bats, I like this example, so I'm going to go some, spend a little time on it. They're their own family, so they're their own kind, according to creationists. They're not strong flyers. They often crawl on the ground. So how the hell do they make it to New Zealand? And only New Zealand. Uh, Qantas Airlines? We got another example. Possibly. Possibly. <laughs> uh, that's just as good an explanation as any, not to be honest. Uh, another example here. Not its own kind. Has to make two trips. Same here. Same here. This is a good example. New Zealand frogs, they need cool, moist environments. And the journey from Turkey would go through unsuitable terrain, warm, and, and seas, salinity. Once arrived, they have to diversify into the several different species, and that in 4,000 years. So good luck with that. New Kapu'u of Kauai, uh, Hawaii again. Round Island boa. Christmas Island blind snake. The Seychelles Sicilian. And Sicilians are nearly impossible to keep in captivity. I've tried. You just can't do it. No one, no one can do it. So Noah wouldn't have been able to do it. Um, well, you know, Noah had God's help. So right. Again, that's three right. miracles. Right. We have to rely on miracles with this. That's right. And finally, the, the Brooksia chameleons of, of Madagascar, these tiny little chameleons that live in damp leaf litter. Somehow they crossed the Middle East and Africa then crossed the sea from Mozambique into Madagascar and diversified on Madagascar into at least 31 species. There are probably a lot more that we don't know about. And they're, look how tiny they are. So and when you compile this onto everything else that we know about Noah's Ark, it, it stuns me that anyone can still pretend that, yeah. that the global flood really happened. I mean, it, they, I, I've talked to believers that you can see the smoke coming out of their ears when you start showing these ideas. I mean, you can you know that they know that they're full of shit, mm. but they have to defend yeah, yeah. the story. I can't imagine I mean, having a you, belief are, that you have to yeah. believe in, even when you know that it's wrong. It's, it must be depressing. I don't have that problem. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nor do I, sir. Yeah. All right. Well, that was uh, that, that was uh, just that was forty five minutes and, mm-hmm. and a very decent presentation. So I want to thank you for uh, for giving that. Do you have anything All to right. close with? Uh, yeah, I just want to say there are thousands of examples like that. I included just a few, uh, not just islands, but continents. Why are all the anteaters, why are armadillos lost over in the New World? How they get there, mm-hmm. and there, there's no explanation. 
the uh, the there's the evolutionary thing that um, that it, what was it the Boreugatherians and Laurasiatherians separated and then the one group yeah. split into Xenarthrans in South America and Afrotherians, of course, in Africa. And how did they, in, in, evolu in evolutionary terms, when you take into uh, you know plate tectonics into account, that makes perfect sense. It does, yeah. But in the Noachian model, nope. No, the, the only way it makes sense is in light of a long period of time, plate tectonics and evolution. Yeah, and you don't have, like you did with some of the others, you don't have a fossil record where you have these things like intermittent in both places. Right. There are no MOA fossils in China. They're only in New Zealand. Indeed. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for, for having me on here, and I hope it was an interesting presentation. It was. Thank you very much for giving it. No problem. Oh, do you have anything you want to pitch? I'll put your I'll put your account your channel. Oh yeah, yeah. my my channel is called uh, Jackson Row. Pretty simple, and I have a Facebook page called Museum of Transitional Fossils. We'll put links to both of those in the description. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Jackson. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much.